The conference is now being recorded. Welcome to the WAM Leaders Investor Conference Call. Chairman Jeff Wilson, Portfolio Manager Matthew Haupt and Senior Equity Analyst John Orb will be leading the call today. Then they will cover some of the pre-registered questions and then we will open the call to investor questions. Chairman Jeff Wilson will begin. Please go ahead. Look, thanks very much. And first of all, thanks everyone for A, supporting us in terms of being you know, shareholders in, in WAM leaders. Um, and secondly, um, spending some of your time at, you know, calling in today and sending in the questions. And what, we're, what we'll, we'll attempt to do is in the presentation we give you to cover off a number of the questions. Um, if not, we'll, um, we'll, fix, we'll do them at the end. The, in terms of you know, WAM leaders, you, you all know, um, or you may not know, that um, it exceeded our expectations in terms of how much money we thought we'd raise. Um, you know, the, the company started trading on the 30th of May, and in terms of from an investment perspective, um, we are pleased with the performance to date. The, you know, the share price a dollar ten issue price with a, a one for one free option. You know, the shares are trading around that you know six dollar sixteen dollar seventeen, and if you have the option, you know, six and a half cents. So the package is you know, people ahead twelve, you know, twelve to twelve and a half or thirteen percent, um, and um, you know so we're pleased with that. In terms of the underlying portfolio, you know, the boys will touch on that and its performance. Um, you know, a little bit later in the conversation, uh, what um, and obviously they'll talk about some stocks. What investors um, continually talk to us about, uh, and we think are very interested, is in dividends and dividend policy. Now, obviously, the plan is to have a a growing or consistent stream of fully frank dividends to be able to pay to shareholders. Um, th these decisions are board decisions. The um, you know, obviously the, our first really half year period is is the period to December, and then the board will review how the portfolio has performed, what our level of franking is, um, and and what the dividend policy will be. Um, it will in terms of dividends, it'll take a little bit of time to build up a you know, good level of franking and a good level of profit reserve. Um, so it's, it's worthwhile to be aware of that. Someone did ask a, a question about um, comparing this dividend to FGX and FGG, which are, are two other entities that we've been in, involved with um, that have a, a charitable purpose. Um, now, the WAM um, leaders' dividend policy will be different to theirs. The WAM leaders' dividend policy will be more in line with the WAM capital dividend policy. But you've got to remember WAM capitals you know, has built up franking and profit reserves over a 17-year period, um, and um, you know, WAM leaders are just starting. Um, the, you know, they're the main things I want to cover off on. Just one thing, the reason we're having this call is because the, um, to keep cost to a minimum, and that's you know, what we like to do. Um, we didn't prepare an annual report. You know, we could have, in theory, prepared. We got a waiver. We could have prepared an annual report for one month's um, you know, trading, but we thought that was just a waste of shareholders' money. Um, and we thought, as we're not having an AGM to correspond with that annual report, um, and the next time we'll see you is when we do the six monthly, um, well, road show. Um, we thought we just would uh, would update you. The um, so that's that's the reason for the call. So now I'll pass over to um, Matt and John, and Matt will you know, take it initially. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jeff, and good minute, good morning to everyone on the call this morning. Um, I'd like you to draw your attention to slide five, which um, if you've got the presentations handy, it, it goes through our top holdings, so it's the top 10 stocks in the portfolio currently. Um, and if you do the maths, if you've been following these stocks, um, you can see for the month to date, um, that top 10 there has returned a little over 1% for the month to date. Um, going through the stocks there, John will talk in detail 
sell around four of those stocks, Aurora, Credit Corp, Aristocrat and Reliance. So I'll just, I'll just touch quickly on Aurora because it's the, the top holding there. Um, that is a company that was spun out of Amcor a few years ago. Um, they released their results on Monday, um, beat expectations and um, rallied strongly on the day. So they're up about 15% for the week. So that's been a great performer. But I'll let John run through that a bit later. The second uh, stock here, ALS Group. Um, the reason why we like this stock at the moment is we think we're in the midst of a recovery in the mining sector after a very tough few years there. A lot of mining companies we have spoken to uh, have raised money uh, just recently and starting to explore again. And also existing miners are increasing volumes, uh, which has been quite a steady trend over the last 12 months. So we think ALS is a distinct opportunity here when they can uh, increase their margins. So they have margins around 10% at the moment. Back in the boom, they're around 30%. So even if they double their margins, we think there's significant upside still to this stock. Another one you can see there uh, going down the list is James Hardy's. The reason why we like James Hardy's is we think the US is still um, in the midst of re recovery in their home building starts. So traditionally the US do around 1.5 million starts a year. We're currently sitting at 1.2 million starts. So we think there's still upside here left in the cycle with James Hardy. And they are really in a dominant position in their um, fibre cement market. They have about 90% market share. Um, and we think they will continue to see good volume growth. They came out with their results uh, for the first quarter last Friday um, and had 16% volume growth. We think the, um, the big impact will be through pricing. So we've seen the volume impact and we expect to see pricing impact over the next few months on, on um, James Hardy's. <coughs> Another stock I'll touch on there, on the bottom of the list there is Eclipse. Uh, we, we quite like Eclipse because um, the management team, we've known them for a long time. They used to be involved with Flexi Group, another ASX listed company. We think Flexi Group, um, Eclipse, sorry, um, will do quite well through a cost out program which they've sort of initiated over the past 12 to 18 months. Looking forward, they're starting to get some top line growth and that cost out program is gaining traction. So we think there's significant earnings upside as well. And going forward, we think there's going to be industry consolidation and we think Eclipse are in a prime position to capitalise on this. So this stock we're quite comfortable on um, going forward. If I turn your attention now to slide six, um, we just thought we'd touch on the global market overview at the moment and outlook. Um, as has been the case since the global financial crisis, global markets have been driven by accommodative central bank policy and this has continued to be the driver. The accommodative policy has created distorted fixed interest markets and pushing up the valuation on risk assets. Post the GSC, there's been over 667 rate cuts from central banks and massive QE programs. Um, recent data I was looking at suggests there's around $13.4 trillion of negative yielding debt at the moment. Um, this has caused a backdrop for, for a bull market in global equities and the current high valuations we see now. We thought with the, uh, the Brexit vote in June, there'd be a perfect um, event for the market to sell off. But what happened was the global yields um, fell to all time lows. And again, this pushed up equity valuations. So despite risk going up, um, equities ended up going up off the back of lower yields. So this trend is still holding and we think that won't change for the immediate future. So since the Brexit vote, um, the Bank of England, Bank of Japan, Reserve Bank of New Zealand, the Reserve Bank of Australia have all moved rates lower. So again, this is very supportive for equity valuations in the short term. So looking forward, economic growth looks quite stable, uh, still tracking below trend. Uh, most central banks remain uh, dovish, with the exception being the Fed, which look like they'll push up rates uh, towards the end of this year. And I guess that's a good segue into some of the stocks we have too. We were quite um, bullish on the US re recovery. And the stocks that we have exposed there are Aurora, James Hardy and Reliance, which you can see in our top 10 there. Um, Europe remains a concern with potential bank issues in Italy um, and the fallout from Brexit. We still haven't seen come through in the data yet. So we're still uh, waiting for that as a potential risk. Emerging markets still um, an issue for uh, anything with US dollar strength, so we remain quite cautious on emerging markets. So we turn our attention now to slide seven, uh, the Australian equity market. 
So looking at Australia, um, the domestic economy continues to go through a transition phase away from the booming mining sector to a more traditional economic cycle with property and infrastructure leading the way. The Australian economy continues grow, to grow at a moderate level of GDP growth with low inflation levels. The RBA, we think, continues to be in a loosening phase, which should be supportive of lengthening the current trends that we're seeing at the moment. On the Australian share market, we, we think it continues to look expensive, but, lead, but believe this is likely to continue for the immediate future. The market is trading well above historical averages, so that makes us cautious. We're still finding many opportunities out there. Earnings growth outlook for FY17, I think, will be mid-single digits at this stage, um, but we're still waiting to see a lot of companies um, report, because it's sort of a one to two weeks into the reporting season at the moment. Um, so if I talk about the trends we're seeing now in reporting season, it looks like top-line growth is still very difficult to achieve. Margins are holding, and earnings growth is still subdued. A trend that we saw in February reporting period is holding true again. That is, companies that are on high valuations that don't meet expectations are being punished exceptionally hard. Companies that are relatively cheap that meet or even just miss expectations are rallying hard for the back of the results. This is a trend we're trying to take advantage of at the moment. And looking now at the outlooks of companies uh, through this reporting season so far, most are flagging low earnings growth. We think valuations at this stage will stretch and expect not too much in the way of equity returns across the market in general. That being said, though, we're still finding opportunities um, that meet our investment criteria. Um, so going forward, I think, I think the um, returns for the Australian equity market looks, I think will be in the mid, mid to high single digits at this stage. But again, we're waiting to see all the companies report and a lot of the companies report towards the end of August. So we'll be updating our views as, as the information comes through. So what I'll do now is hand over to John Ayew, um, a senior equity analyst on, on WAM leaders, to run through some of the stocks in detail for us. Thanks, Matt. Uh, firstly, this morning we'd like to talk about three stocks that form part of our research-driven portfolio before turning, turning to a stock that fits within our market-driven side of the portfolio. The first investment from the research-driven portfolio that we would like to discuss and we like is Reliance Worldwide Corporation, ASX code RWC. Reliance is a leading designer and manufacturer of water flow and control products for the behind-the-wall plumbing industry. With a current market cap of $1.7 billion, it trades on an FY17 PE of 27 times and with forecast EPS growth of around 27%. After a successful IPO in April this year, we continue to like this investment for a number of reasons. Firstly, we are attracted to RWC because of its strong and experienced management team, with an average tenure of senior management being well over 20 years. From its small beginnings in Victoria, Reliance has managed to build a global business. And that global business has driven a, an annual compound growth rate of around 13.5% between FY06 and FY15. Today, more than 75% of net sales are derived from outside Australia, with a bulk of those coming from the United States. We see further upside from the continued penetration of Reliance's core brass fitting products, branded SharkBite. This product utilises labour saving push to connect technology and is broadly used in both commercial and residential applications. SharkBite is a market-leading product in Australia, US and Canada. Reliance first introduced this product into the United States 11 years ago, and today it has around 80% share of that category for residential applications. Further, Reliance is a leader in innovation and manufacturing excellence. With much of the current product suite exposed to, their repair, to the repair and renovate housing market, Reliance has developed a number of new products to open up opportunities to the new home-built market in the US. One such product we are excited about is the in-house manufactured and designed and patent-protected Evo, Evo PEC fitting system. This product is due for release later this year and could provide a strong platform to tackle the new home-built market in the US. Next, we turn to the largest position in WAM leaders, Aurora Limited, ASX code ORA. As Matt mentioned earlier, it was spun out of Ampool and reported earlier this week and, and, and since then has returned 15%. By way of background, Aurora is a leading packaging company with operations in Australia and America. Its market cap is around $4 billion, trading on FY17P of 21 times with a, and forecast EPS of circa 16%. We really like the defensive nature of Aurora's business, with its primary exposure to beverage and food consumption. We all see Aurora's products on a daily basis, be it in beverage cans, 
boxes that carry our fruit and vegetable or even the glass bottles that bring us our wine. All are integral in every aspect of, of the delivery of consumables from manufacturers to consumers. Again, with a strong leadership team, Aurora have been able to drive cost efficiencies in the business and continue to win market share in all categories of operation. We continue to see scope for further cost opportunities to boost margin and to offset any input headwinds they may face from rising energy costs. Going forward, we are attracted to the potential for bolt-on acquisitions in the US to drive further growth. The recent acquisition of Integra Color highlights this and it provides a platform to grow its footprint across the, America, the Americas in the point of purchase display market. We see Aurora as conservatively geared at present and we see potential for them to deploy more than 150 million per annum in investments over the next few years to drive these growth opportunities. Moving over to Credit Corp now. This is a company we have followed for a long time. It's a buyer of Australian and US debt ledgers and has, the, and has a personal loan book in Australia. We rate management highly and think they are in a prime position to capitalise on industry dynamics. Its market cap is circa $800 million with an, with an FY17 PE of around 14 times and we expect around 20% EPS growth. The reason why we like Credit Corp at the moment is we think that two of the three divisions can grow at a fast pace. The first growth division is the personal lending book. Credit Corp has recently ramped up their personal lending and we are now seeing strong growth in this book. Typically, as a loan book matures, it becomes very profitable and we think that we are approaching that, this stage now. We think that they can continue to grow the loan book for the current product suite and coupled with the introduction of new products, we, we forecast that this could be as large as the more mature Australian purchase debt ledger book. Secondly, growth, the, growth, the second growth division we like is the US PDL business. Due to regulatory issues, the US PDL book has shrunk over three billion. US PDL market, sorry, has shrunk by over three billion. As such, opportunities were scarce, and pricing made it hard to compete for, for Credit Corp. We are now getting we are now getting some clarity around around the US regulatory environment, and we think the US PDL market could regain that three billion of volume per annum. Credit Corp have been disciplined through this period, and we think they can now compete and win a decent market share going forward. Again, we think this business can be the, the same size as the Australian PDL business. Now shifting quickly to the market-driven part of our portfolio, and one investment that has worked for us and we continue to like is Aristocrat Leisure, ASX code AWL. Many of you will be familiar with Aristocrat, but as a refresher, Aristocrat is a leading developer, manufacturer and distributor of gaming content, gaming platforms and systems globally. Its current market cap is around $10 billion with an FY17P of 22 times and forecast EPS growth of around 20%. I'll start off by saying that the poker machine industry is very cyclical and accordingly companies that have invested through the cycle are typically rewarded with the lion's share of new sales. Over the past few years, Aristocrat have invested heavily in people, product design and developed a game library that has resulted in a dominant market share position in Australia and an ever strengthening position in the US replacement and participation markets. This product here has been driven by new products such as Lightnings and Buffalo, and Buffalo Grant. These products are delivering results well above house average return and accordingly consumer demand for these products is driving that market share movement toward aristocrat away from some of the, more, some of the larger US competitors, many of whom have their own balance sheet issues. We believe that their game library bank will continue to drive that market share growth for the coming years and, we can, can, and then we see their ability to pull price lever to help drive margin improvement. Further, we also attracted to the social gaming side of the business that has, that has generated more than 100% growth for the past few years. Recent comparable transactions in this space, in the social gaming space, I should say, highlight potential growth and valuation upside there. So that's all I'll touch on at the moment. I'll pass over to Alex, Alex Hopper, our Senior Communications Advisor. Thank you, John, and thanks everyone for dialing in. Um, shareholder communication is extremely important to us and we do this through our weekly email, monthly NTA reports, half and full year results, um, obviously our website, media, independent research, investor calls like today, and our monthly investor roadshow. Um, our next investor roadshows are coming up in November, beginning in Adelaide on the 16th and ending in Brisbane on the 24th. A full list of dates and venues is available on our website, and next month you'll be receiving an invitation um, to these presentations in the mail. 
I'd um, like to come up, cover off some of the pre-registered questions now, and then we'll open the call to any other questions following that. Um, we've received a few questions regarding um, options, and both the use of options in the portfolio and options outstanding in land leaders. Matt, did you want to touch on that? Yes, yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, as far as options go, um, the use of options within the portfolio is not within our mandate. So within our mandate, we don't have the ability to trade options, uh, write options, um, and, and there's no gearing. So as far as options within the portfolio go, um, that, that is, can't happen. Um, the other question we had in was regarding the, the outstanding WAM leaders options, uh, which are trading on the market. So. Um, those are still um, uh, available to trade, to buy and sell or exercise. Um, they have an expiry of November 2017 um, and we'll be sending regular updates uh, around dividend dates. So if those people wish to exercise options before uh, the potential dividend dates, uh, we'll be sending reminders. So that, that's an update on the, on the options at the moment. And we also... Um had a few questions regarding our current cash weighting. <coughs> Matt? Yeah, sure. Um, cash weighting is at the moment, you would have seen at the NTA, um, we have around 30% cash. Um, how I see that um, fluctuating around at the moment, uh, I think the equity weightings uh, we have now we're quite comfortable with. And during reporting season, there's quite often trading opportunities. So I'd expect our cash weighting to decrease over the next week or so. And then I think going long term, if I look long term, the WAM products traditionally have around 35% cash. Uh, I think WAM leaders will be around that 25 to 30% cash level um, uh, over, over time. So I think it will be slightly more invested um, given the liquidity uh, potential of the top 200 stocks. So I think that's how our cash weightings will play out. Thanks, Matt. Um, and we've also a question around um, liquidity and position sizing in the portfolio. Uh, Matt or John, did either of you want to take that one? I'm happy to answer that one. Um, as you can see from our top 10 holdings that we released this morning, we, we found it quite, um, yeah, liquidity quite accessible, um, particularly in those top 100 stocks. And, and one of the original reasons what, that we launched uh, WAM Leaders was basically to find those more liquid markets. Um, e even so, beyond that top 100 space, in a name like Credit Corp, which is a, which is a stock that we like as a, as a, as a group in, in total, uh, we were able to source um, sufficient liquidity to get to our target weighting of that, of that around 4% of the portfolio. So um, we have been able to size the, the positions rightly and we continue to um, you know, work towards target weights across the portfolio. So the, the strategy to date has worked, worked well. Thanks, John. And now we'd like to open up the call to any questions um, that you may have. Thank you. We will just stop the recording now.